Okay, I, I have two topics left and only one hour, an hour and a half. And each of these topics takes about an hour and a half. So there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. Right? So my first idea was, I'm going to let you vote on which one you would prefer. But that would be an uninformed vote, I think. And we all know that uninformed votes are not a good thing to do in a democracy. <laughs> the other option was I, I talked to an expert. <laughs> and the expert told me, well, one of the topics I'm going to do tomorrow anyway, so you know who the expert is. <laughs> I'm not looking at him. And so that gave me a slight preference for the thing that he's not going to talk about because that gives you a wider range of topics. Anyway, my slides are available for that topic. That is slide number five. It's the slide on um, non-binary models. I'm sorry, Hannah. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not going to do the non-binary models. You, uh, you woke up right in time for the non-binary models. And I'm not going to do it now, I'm really sorry. But um, before I go there, I'm just going to finish this exercise on expectation and then, and then we can move on to the topic about <coughs> randomness and imprecision. So the combination of random numbers and, and imprecision and, and how that works. So this is more of the huh, frequentist type of imprecise problem that I'm going to talk about. The other one was still decision theory. So what I'm going to talk about next after this is completely different. This is why I need you fresh. Uh, okay, so the base thing, I have an expectation and the condition is that the expectation of G minus alpha times the indicator of A should be positive. That is the condition on alpha. So this is this thing here is just the expectation of G times the indicator of A minus alpha times the indicator of A. And since my expectation is linear function is linear functional, I can just write this as the expectation of G times the indicator of A minus alpha times the expectation of the indicator of A. The expectation of the indicator of A is the probability of A. So this is equal to expectation plus G times the indicator of A minus alpha the probability of A. And the condition is that that should be positive. Or in other words, alpha times the probability of A should be strictly smaller than the expectation of G times the indicator. And this is where we need the fact that this guy, the probability of A is positive. You can understand, I can divide both sides by the same positive thing, and I find that this is equivalent to the expectation of the example multiplied by the indicator of A divided by the probability. So I'm looking at the supremum over all alpha. Satisfies these, and that satisfies these conditions, so the supreme is this. This is what I wanted to prove. Right? I'm not going to touch the transparency. But <laughs> yeah. And you can do the same thing for the upper. Now the upper gives you something completely similar. So we get that, that thing, and then once we have that thing, all we have to do is replace we have the G by the indicator of B. So G times the indicator of A is the indicator of A times the indicator of B. But that is just the indicator of the intersection of the indicator. This is only one if both of them are one. So if I'm in the intersection. And then the expectation. And so here then I find the expectation of the indicator of the intersection, and that is the probability of the intersection. And that gets me to the second line here, probability of the intersection. And we're done. 
So that tells you that phase rule is a special case. Right, let's move to non-binary preference. That was the thing that I that I'm not going to do. So let's move to randomness and indecision. Oh, there's a question. Sorry. Please explain why G is equal to the case of B. This one? So, yeah. <laughs> Where was I? No, 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 no. no. Here. So I, I want you to look at the probability of B given A, the probability of an event is the expectation of its indicator. So I'm looking for the expectation of G given A, where G is the indicator of B. Yeah? So when G is the indicator of B, I'm plugging this into this equation, but what I'm going to get is the probability of B given A. Right? Okay. Anybody else at this point? No? Let's go back to random decision. Okay. Now this is, you know, in a sense, much more personal stuff because it's it's work that results from a close collaboration between a number of people, me, Jasper de Bock, who is a colleague in Ghent, and Floris, who is, is here in the, uh, in the audience, is hiding now. <laughs> yeah, he's there. Yeah. So let me talk about this because I'm, I'm really excited about this. Also, there's a number of people who have influenced my views. You see Delhi there with his uh, very beautiful, um, what is it, your parallelic tetrahedron? That's, that's right, yeah. Your tetrahedron, your independence, your independence. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't bring it with me. Oh, it's so sad. Yeah. Anyway, you, you see him with this, uh, this thing, and he's probably going to use it. Uh, or tell 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 you, tell you all something about it now tomorrow. No, so okay. You've had half the experience already today. Yeah, and there's a number of other people who have uh, influenced our views, and and so it's been a privilege. Uh, and I think it's also at this point uh, nice to mention that this um, is an answer or the beginning of an answer. What we're doing here to a number of questions that were. Ray raised by, uh, by Terry Fine, who sadly passed away in January of last year. And so this is also my opportunity to, he, he was a, 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 one of the very first members of our society. And so it's also an opportunity to, to honor him here. Uh, I'm happy to be able to do that. Okay, so random sequences. I'm looking at a sequence of zeros and ones, heads, tails, but I would just two things, and I repeat an experiment. Sunny weather, rainy weather, whatever you can call one or zero, which will be call one and zero. So you repeat an experiment, and you record the outcomes of that experiment, two possible values, and so you get a sequence of zeros and ones. And you ask yourself, hey, when is such a sequence of zeros and ones, when is it random? Now, <clears throat> It might surprise to 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 hear that um, this in itself is is not not a reasonable question because in order to answer that question you need forecasts in 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 the case of a fair coin if you rec record the sequences of heads and tails in a fair coin your forecasts are typically 
typically one half. So the idea is that before you observe your coin toss, the coin flip, the outcome of that coin flip, the first one, you will have an idea. And you say, okay, the, the, expect, the expected value is one half. Or well, the probability of heads or the probability of a one is one half. So the expected value of, of the outcome is one half. And then, so this is your forecast. And then you observe a zero. And then you move on to the next outcome. You again have a forecast. And again, in the Fed coin case, this is one half. And again, you observe a one in this case, and so on. But the idea is that ahead of each outcome in black, there will always be, in this case, implicitly, because you're working with the Fed coin, implicitly, there will be a forecast there, some expectation. What do you, what do you expect? That will always be there. Now, you can generalize this, of course, by going from a fair coin to a precise forecast. Say that you're forecasting sunny weather. And so the first day, you have your, for, your probability for sunny weather the next day. And then the next day come, and you see, ugh, it's rainy weather. Good. Get a zero. And then the next day, you get an, an, a new forecast for sunny weather. And you give a new probability for sunny weather. And you observe the weather and you say, ha ha, sun is shining, and so on. So each day you give a new forecast. And what you have is a sequence of forecasts. And then immediately followed by the outcome of the thing that you've forecast, that you've given a forecast for. What I'm going to talk about here is something even more general. I will allow you to make a forecast that is interval value to say, OK, my lower probability or my probability for nice weather tomorrow, the sunshine tomorrow, is not a precise number, but it's, a, it's an interval. Prob probability of, of sunny weather is between 0.2 and 0.7, something like that. And then I observe, and it's raining. The next thing I give you a forecast, I too interval to uh, second outcome, and it's sunny, and so on. So each time my outcome is preceded by an imprecise interval forecast. That is what I'm going to talk about here. Now, when you look at it this way, what you observe is that now you ask yourself, when is the sequence of outcomes random, not just on itself, but with respect to this forecast? And randomness will then mean that the outcome sequence and the forecast sequence that precedes it are well calibrated in the sense that you are, if you emit those forecasts, that you are in some sense a good forecast. In some sense, and I'm going to define in what sense you are a good forecast. So happens. So that is what we're going to talk about. The idea is that randomness will be about the forecast sequence and the outcome sequence going together well, which is why I had this uh, wonderful opportunity to put that Beatles song, the cover of the the first single uh, here in the UK. Okay, so what that means is that there are two, <laughs> two sides to this coin. Yeah? There are two questions that we can answer. The first one is. I have a certain forecast sequence, and I can ask myself, what are the sequences of zeros and ones that go together well with this forecast sequence? So in that case, I'm starting with a forecast sequence, and I'm looking at all the sequences that are random for this forecast sequence. And that is what has been done traditionally. Okay? I start with a pair coin forecast sequence, one half all the time. And I'm looking at all the outcome sequences that are random for this forecast sequence one half. But we can go the other way around. And this is not something that has been looked at, I think, very, very often. And that is, if I have a given outcome sequence, what are the forecast sequences that go together well with that given outcome sequence? You have a sequence of zeros and ones. What are the forecast sequences that go together with that one? That's another side of the calibration issue. So there's two sides to this, and I want to keep, you to keep that in mind. So 
It will be about forecasting. And so I'm going to begin with the very simple problem of a single outcome. I'm going to forecast a single outcome first, and then later on, I will move to an infinity of outcomes, a sequence of outcomes. But first things first, simple things first, a single forecast. So I have a random outcome, x, something well, an outcome, a variable, you know, with something, two possible outcomes, zero and one. All the figures in the previous slides were about two possible outcomes. And now if I have a precise forecast, this precise forecast is the probability of one. So somebody, you, give a probability, a forecaster gives a probability of one. And the probability of one is P. So I'm in this situation here. I'm in the situation before the experiment is done. I have this three, two possibilities, zero and one. One with probability P, this is my forecast, probability of one, and then one with probability one minus P, I have a zero. What is the expectation here? The expectation is P times one plus one minus P times zero, so that is P. So the expected value of my variable, my forecast P, is also the expectation of, my, of, of a one. It's a probability that it's equal to one. It's also the expected expected value of my of my uh, of my variable. Okay. This is something you've seen many times before today. If I have a gamble, I can represent this because there's two possible outcomes, zero and one. I can represent this by a point in this two-dimensional space with the coordinate in one and the coordinate in zero. So. <clears throat> this is what happens. So what I'm doing is, if I have a gamble, then I will also have a forecast for that expected value of that, of that gamble. So that will give me P times the value in one plus one minus P times the value in zero. And so giving a forecast is actually equivalent to defining an expectation operator on gambles in the sense that if I have the probability of one, I can calculate the expectation of any gamble in this way. I take the probability of the function in one and the one minus the probability of the function in zero, and that gives me the expectation. And this expectation operator allows me, also something that you've seen, allows me to just to subdivide the region of the gambles into two subregions. There is the line where, these expect, where this expectation is zero. The normal on that line corresponds to the point P, one minus P, or P is this number here. It says, okay. So all the gambles here have a positive expectation, and all the gambles in this blue region have a negative expectation. Now I am the forecaster. I have, for all the gambles in this blue region, I have a negative expectation. So those are the gambles I don't really want, because to me, they're not very useful because they have a negative expectation. I think they are worse than zero. I will be willing to give them away. Just by specifying the, the value P here, there's this entire region, of the blue region of gambles that I would be willing to give away because of this specification of the forecast. And so you are a skeptic. I'm the forecaster. You are the skeptic. You, are, you want to test my forecasts. You want to make me put my money where my mouth is. My mouth is P. My money is the blue region. I'm willing to give away all these gamblers. So, what I'm actually doing is I'm offering you, because I think their expectation is negative, I'm offering you all these gambles. So you can take them if you want them. This means that you, as a, as a skeptic, can take me up on those gambles, on the blue gambles, because they're the ones that I'm going to offer you. I'm so pick any one. That is what I'm actually saying. You can pick any gamble in the blue region, just by specifying the P, that is the interpretation. Those are the gambles that I, you can pick anyone. I 
and, you, and then we will look at, so you pick a gamble here in this blue region here you pick one and then if the outcome is one i will get this and if the outcome is zero and you will get the minus of that this is a zero-sum game we bet against each other you test me as a forecaster you as a skeptic test me you can take that gamble and you will get that and i will have to pick you whatever the outcome of that gamble. so this is a single forecaster meaning all the blue regions are available to you as a skeptic they are the gambles with a uh, let's say a non-negative expectation. Yeah. I'm going to allow the gambles on, on, the, on the blue line as well. They don't really matter. I can, I can exclude them, but they make mathematics a little bit easier if I allow the blue ones on the blue line as well. So what happens if, instead of giving a precise forecast, I give an imprecise, an interval forecast. So in that case, I give a lower probability and an upper probability for heads or for one, and then the corresponding lower probability and upper probability for zero. And that gives me, in, in the way that we've done, we've been doing, gives me a range, a lower expectation and an upper expectation. Any gamble. The idea is that the gambles that I will find desirable are the ones to the right of these two lines here. This is my cone of desirable gambles. The ones that, that are negative, these gambles are the ones that I will be giving away. Yeah? So these are the ones that I want to get. These are the ones that I'm willing to give away, minus the ones that I want to get. So this blue region, the, blue, the region with a negative upper expectation of the negative values of the gambles that I want to get, the ones with the, not positive, with the positive upper expectation. So the ones with the negative lower expectation, the gambles that I'm willing to give away. So these are the gambles that you can get as a forecaster. You can pick any of these gambles and test me using any of these gambles. By specifying this interval in my forecast, I am implicitly saying these are the gambles that you want to do. Is that clear so far? Because this is the basis. If you don't understand this, then the rest is going to be completely not understandable. Yeah. I'm struggling a little bit with the intent of the interpretation. So, like, in the sort of game theory context that you're imagining, don't I just restrict the forecasts that I make to the top right quadrant and force you to choose the ones that are dominated, leaving the second and fourth quadrants totally undecided? Yeah. Of course, you leave on the table all of the possible value that I get from parts of the second and fourth quadrant. I am sure that you're going to lose, or at least that uh, you won't win. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a standard big theoretic objection to specifying lower and upper expectation. Okay. Why, not, why, not give a, why not give a factor set of all ways? Because that. But this is not something you will do as a forecaster, right? I mean, you, you're, you're giving, I think, if I'm a weather forecaster. My reputation will suffer if I get certain forecasts, right? So there's there's cost to giving certain forecasts that are not very useful. And there's cost to giving bad forecasts. I'm not going to go really into it, but let's just play along with me that, that you can you can give bad almost forecasts of what you can do. You can give up the arguments, but I know that there is this possible objection, but let's forget about it. Let's just play along with this book. Because I think there's interesting things happening later on. I didn't realize that this was an objection or just some misunderstanding. So I didn't no, but yeah, it's, yeah. Let's assume that this 
this is, this is your, your best attempt at giving a, or my best attempt at giving a, a reasonable forecast. Yeah. Okay. So I have this upper expectation, and these are the gambles that are available to you as a as a skeptic. Okay, so this was the situation for a single forecast. Now I'm going to extend this idea to many subsequent forecasts. So today, tomorrow, and all the subsequent days, I'm going to do forecasts for the weather or for, for a coin, something with two possible outcomes. This is something that I've already indicated in a previous, uh, previous lecture. If you do this, you can represent all the possible sequences of zeros and ones that I could get as a result of doing these experiments by this, this tree, this event tree. So these are all the possible sequences of zeros and ones that I could get. I've stopped here at the third experiment, but it could go on and on and on. I might, my tree would become ever more complicated. It would look wider and wider. The idea is that I get situations. The situations are the blue things here. They summarize what happens. So here, for instance, I first observed a zero, then a one, and a zero. Here, I first observed a zero and a one, and then two things can happen. Either the, the next outcome will be either zero or one, and so on. So this is a way, nice graphical way of representing everything that could happen. So any blue thing is what I call a situation. I call that S. S is a situation. It's a finite sequence of outcomes. So all these outcomes, X are either zero or one. And the set of all these finite strings of zeros and ones, I will call that the set of all possible situations. And then the set of all infinite sequences of zeros and ones. So if I keep going on and on and on until very deep, never ending, so an infinite sequence of zeros and one, I will call omega, and I will call that a path in the tree. And the set of all possible paths, so all possible sequences of zeros and ones, will be, uh, will be denoted by omega. Um, when there are only two possible outcomes, there is a nice correspondence between omega and the set of all the real numbers between zero and one. Just these are binary, you could consider them to be binary expansions of, of any real number between, between zero and one. There is this correspondence. Okay. Right. So what happens in a fair coin tree, if I do fair coins, and what I'm doing is I'm attaching to each, each of these situations, I'm attaching a forecasting function forecast and the forecast is in each situation what is my forecast for the next one in this case it's one half if i've observed a zero here then my probability for the for the next outcome to be one is going to be one half so i get a probability one half here and a probability one half. the same one half is attached to each of these situations it is what i call a fair coin three but i could do something uh, and then this is the standard situation that we did, we, we discussed in, in the study of randomness. So what, what Per Martin Löw did was he said, okay, I have this probability measure that is on all the paths. So if I have this tree, maybe I should make this a bit more clear. If I have this tree here on, on then, then on all the infinite paths, on, on all the infinite strings, this tree will correspond to the Lebesgue measure, the uniform measure, because it's, it's the same probability everywhere. It will correspond to the uniform probability measure on, on the real tree. That is what we get in the end for all the paths, all the infinite sequences of zeros and ones. It's a uniform probability there. So the Lebesgue measure. That is that P one half. So on, on all the paths, which is which is in, in essence equivalent to, to zero and one. And then a randomness test. This is what what uh, Per Martin Leut at some point said. This is a way to define the randomness of a sequence. 
what, what are the random sequences that correspond to this probability tree? With one half everywhere, this fair point tree, what are the random sequences? How do we define them? Well, he, he had an idea that you can define a randomness test, and that is going to be, so I have this, this set of all paths, and it will have a sequence of open sets, yeah. cylinder sets, open, what are called open sets. And this, this is a, a, a sequence, it's in some way computable. I'm not going to computable means that I can write it, uh, uh, I can write some, some code that generates these sets. Then it's, it's computable by, by a computer, yeah. And I have this sequence of open sets of this type. And the idea is that, it's, uh, so it's an infinite sequence and, and I can calculate each of these subsequent sets. And the idea is that they are such that the probability of this set at, at n will become smaller and smaller with n in this, in this exponential fashion. So, sets, they will become increasingly unlikely, increasingly improbable. And then a path succeeds a randomness test if it's not in the intersection of all these sets. And then this is just one randomness test, but with every such sequence that I can imagine that satisfies these properties is another randomness test. And so a random path will be random if it succeeds all these randomness tests. And in honor of Martin Luth, we call this notion Martin Luth. <laughs> Quite a, a nice picture if you're a philosopher, if you can stand in front of You can only do this if, if, if you have, I don't know, if you have guts. <laughs> yeah? What's the name the real world is the computer? Yeah, the computable. Uh, this is... I, I'm just seeing, for example, in that book, for example, it's cool, uh, the sequence that does test, 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 and, and the law of large numbers gives you gives you ever tighter bounds on, on probabilities, and, and these were computable cylinder sets. And so, if you if you implement the law of large numbers and the bounds that this weak law of large numbers gives you, then you will get uh, one typical computable sequence of sets that satisfies this ever more. So all, all, so everything that fails this set will will, do, will happen. So that is. And then he said, this is how he got to, to this idea. So this is one way of, of being random, satisfying the law of large numbers. But there are many such limit properties. And the idea is that all of them can be represented by computable sequences of effectively open sets that become increasingly. So it's an absolute he, he, he turns the law of large numbers into an abstract property. So these are these conditions are all the laws of large numbers that were all the limit properties that we could computably imagine. That's the idea. And so if you if you if you uh, succeed in all these limit laws, then your sequence is defined to be random. That is the idea. But it must be computable if they're not computable then. Then you, you, you will you will exclude too too many or get too many things that are not supposed to be done. That is the idea. So the computability is always there to eliminate the obvious things. Okay, so this this way of looking at things is what we call probabilistic. Yeah? I have a probability measure on the sample space. I define a number sequence of sets and the sets in their probability on the entire sample space must satisfy the condition that they are decreasingly 
of increasing the employment. So the idea is that this is defined on globally yeah, on, on the sample space. There's a probability measure on the sample space. It's global. I assume that there is this probability measure on the sample space, and I define this type of range. There is nothing partial probability about this. Partial probability says I have local assessments, and I will try to come up with a randomness definition that is based on these local assessments of what is going to happen immediately after something else happens. No, I define this type of randomness in a way that I look at all these, I wait until all the outcomes are done, infinitely many outcomes, and then after that is done, I will have one probability measure over all the possible paths, and I'm going to use that probability measure to determine whether this uh, sequence is random. That is what I call global. This is nothing to do with partial probability specification. How can we come up with a definition that is not global, but local? Well, this was an idea that was first put forward by Jean Ville, a French mathematician, probabilist in, uh, I think, right before the war or during the Second World War, I think 1939, in his PhD thesis. He gave an alternative characterization of randomness. He gave this definition of randomness before Martin Luth gave his definition, but it was somehow ignored. Or in a sense, his criticism was taken into account by Martin Luth. And so it was Martin Luth who got away with the credit and Bill was somehow forgotten. Somehow. So what did he do? So the idea is, is very simple. I have this probability tree with the probability one half everywhere. And remember, this is a precise forecast. I have a forecaster who in each of these situations emits the forecast one half. This means that in each of these situations in this tree, my skeptic will have a number of gambles available to them, namely the ones with a negative expectation corresponding to the probability one half. So the ones that are to the left of to below this, this blue line. And this in each of these situations, here I have this blue region of gambles available. And so my, my skeptic can pick any of these gambles and bet. So here in this situation, say I pick this gamble here. This is available to me. And then what happens? Well, the outcome is either zero or one. If it's one, this is the outcome. If it's zero, this, this is the outcome. If it's zero, this is the outcome. So just pick the gamble, see what happens if it's one, see what happens if it's zero. If it's one, and, and so what happens is I can do that in each of these situations. So if I start, I, as a skeptic, or you, you as a skeptic, you as a skeptic, if I start with some initial capital here, I pick a gamble, then what will happen is either this will happen or this will happen. If I have picked a gamble here and this happens, then the result will be the value of the gamble that I picked in one. And you get that value, so you change your initial capital by adding the value that you get here. If it's positive, you will increase your capital here. If it's negative, you will decrease your capital. And the same here, if I pick that gamble and this happens, then the value in one will be added to the gamble. When I'm here, again, you as a skeptic will pick any gamble that is available to you. And what will happen is either zero will happen or one will happen. And in both cases, something will be added to your cap the capital that you have here. And that something is completely determined by the gamble that you picked, and so on. So if you, as a skeptic, you can pick any available gamble. In each situation, you can pick any gamble that is available to you there. Any gamble in the blue region there. 
And in this way, you can increase, you, you can you can you start with an initial capital, and by chip, by taking a gamble, you, you just populate the entire tree with capital. Just choose a gamble and it will permeate your tree with capital. So remember in the beginning, I called the process something that it attaches a value to each of the nodes in the tree. In this way. I define a capital process. It is a process that you get as a skeptic. It is a capital that you get in each situation as a skeptic by selecting a gamble in each of the situations. If I select a gamble in each of the situations, it will populate the tree with capital that results from the bets. So the capital will be completely determined by the gambles that you select. Is that clear? More or less. Okay. If you do that, the capital that you can in this way build is what we call a super marketing deal. That is what we call a super super marketing deal. It's a stochastic process. It's a process where the expectation in each situation of the increase of the capital in each situation is negative. And why is that? Because you've picked a gamble in the blue region, so the expectation of the gamble is, is negative. So the local increase, the expectation of the local increase of the capital in each situation, because you've picked a gamble in the blue region, it's going to be negative. So your process is expected to decrease, and that is what we call a supermarketing deal. Supermarketing deal is just a capital process that is expected to decrease. Okay. So the supermarketing deals are just all the possible capital processes that you, as a skeptic, can build by selecting gambles in the blue regions in each situation. Those are all supermarketing. Because the local increase is expected to be negative. Yeah. That's the basic idea. So there's a one to one correspondence between the mathematical notion of the super martingale, on the one hand, and the capital that you can, you as a skeptic, can accumulate or lose by betting on the experiment in each situation. And so what did view say? A path is random. If there is no strategy, if there is no capital function, if there's no supermarketing here, for which the capital that you accumulate along that path, so you take a path in the tree, and in each of the situations of that path, you have a capital. Capital, if that capital increases without bounds along, along that path, that means that by betting you become infinitely rich on that path. By taking the bets that are available to you, there is a strategy for you, there is a capital function for you that becomes infinitely rich there. Which means that you have a martingale, a super martingale, or a strategy for becoming infinitely rich on that path. If that super Martin here becomes unbounded to become infinitely rich on that path, and moreover, there's two more conditions on that super Martin here. The first one, the first condition is it should be non-negative everywhere. So it should be bounded below by zero. Why? Because we don't want you to borrow money. Yeah. So you have to make sure that in your strategy, you never get below zero because then you would have to borrow money. And we're not allowing you to borrow money. So you must have a strategy that allows you to become infinitely rich on that path without borrowing money. So you have to be your, your strategy. Your capital must be remain positive everywhere or non-negative everywhere. 
And, and this is the computability condition again, it must be not, well, not computable, what we call low percent computable. That means that there is a computer program that can approximate your capital uniformly in every situation, uniformly by, uh, from, from below. So there's a computer program that allows you to, that works in every situation, it's a plug in situation, and you can calculate it from below. Uh, you can approximate it from there. That is lower set. Yeah. Um, just confused. So, the Latin strategy selects the animal. Yeah. So, in what sense do you like to approximate the strategy? You approximate the supermarket data that corresponds to it. You have a strategy selecting the apple, you have that strategy, you have a supermarket data that corresponds to it, and that supermarket data must be lower set. So, there must be some way of computing this. And then this is an, another way of defining randomness. This is what John Gill proposed. He proposed this definition for randomness. So the idea is, yeah? What if the capital remains zero? That it doesn't go to infinity. And so if there, that, well, that, 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 that capital, maybe there's another strategy that gives you all along that path when, uh, an infinite capital. And then your path is not random. So the idea is you can't break the bank. The sequence of outcomes, you can't break the bank. So, so it, there's no way, you have no strategy that is computable that allows you to become infinitely rich by flipping, by, by, by betting on flipping coins. So the, the sequence of zeros and ones is random. If you can't find it, if there is no strategy that allows you to become infinitely rich by betting without borrowing, that is the idea. So if you would find zeros first and then something else has to happen. So if you first have a lot of zeros, then it's, then it's not random, but then that's, then you, because then you can still it becomes okay. it becomes unbounded. Yeah. So yeah. so you only look at, at what happens here in, in the end at infinity. Yeah. yeah. So so the beginning doesn't really matter. But yeah, if it's all zeros in the beginning, then that is better because of zero. Because of yeah, because if you only look at the whether it's unbounded at infinity. Yeah. So because you, you take the entire path. So you it has to be unbounded for every possible. Outcome. So this is another definition, and this is a local definition. Why? Because of the notion of a super martingale or a capital process, if you want, is local. Something is it, what determines whether something is a super martingale are the local probabilities one half. You pick in each each of these blue regions, you pick a gamble. Local. There's nothing about the probability on paths here. It, what, you do is you pick in each set, in, in each situation, you pick a gamble. So local definition. These two guys in the 1970s proved, 60s, 70s proved that the global and the, glo and the, and the local approaches are equivalent. This is Klaus Peter Schnorr and Leonid Levin. Independently from one another, they proved that the, the Martin Leuf approach and the real approach are actually the same thing. That whether you go, you have the local definition or the global definition, that doesn't really matter. They are equivalent. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Does it is it sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, is it like for specific sequence of all the tennis sequences? All of them. All of them. Yeah. So, all the tests that you might you might impose that are computable in that sense, they must satisfy all and then it's fine. So this was precise forecast. This is one half the fair point forecast. So how do we define randomness for interval forecasts? Well, there's not much difference. The idea is the same. I have an imprecise probability tree rather than one half everywhere. 
I'm going to specify a forecast function that gives me an interval. So in each situation, the forecaster specifies an interval of probabilities for what is going to happen in the next event, for the next experiment, for the next outcome. And so I have the interval in the root, the interval after observing zero, the interval after observing a one, interval after observing a one and a one, and so on. So this is the, in each of the, each of the nodes, in each of the situations, I now have an interval forecast. Okay. All right, so now, what does this mean? In each of these situations, I have a convex cone, no longer semi-space, but a convex cone of gambles that you, the skeptic, can choose from. Before, there were the gambles below the one half region, expectation, negative expectation. Now, they're in this, uh, the, the, the minus of the cone of, of the desirable gambles here. So they're in this, the minus of all the gambles before. So you, as a forecaster, uh, you as a skeptic can pick in each of these situations, you can now pick a gamble in the blue region. And in very much the same way as before, you can use these gambles to populate your tree with capital. If you choose a gamble in each of these blue regions, this will populate your tree with capital. You start with an initial capital here, and then you, you've picked a gamble in here that will give you in one a value, it will give you a, a here a value, you add it to your initial capital and you get the capital here and the capital here. We start here, you pick a gamble in this blue region, it will give you, it will add to your capital here and add to your capital here the outcome of this gamble, and so on. There's no difference in, in idea between the one half case and this case. It's just the same thing. You just choose gambles. You, as a as skeptic, choose gambles that are available to you. There's just fewer gambles available to you because there's no longer semi spaces but cones. So it's you, you can choose from fewer gambles. This means that you have fewer ways to get rich. There will be fewer ways to get infinitely rich. So it will be easier to be random for a sequence. Because random means you can't get infinitely rich. If there are fewer ways to become infinitely rich, it's easier to be random. That is the idea. So this is our definition of a random path is random. I have a super martingale, it's a capital process in the same way by selecting a gamble that is available. And then a path is again in this new way, Martin at random, if there is no strategy that is lower semi-computable, where the accumulated capital remains non-negative, so you're not allowed to borrow money, and along this path becomes on Again, just the same way as before. It's nothing different. It's just that the notion of the super martingale is a bit different now. What we've also proved is that you can define this defines randomness. There's a global way of defining randomness in very much the same way as before. But now we will have an upper probability that is bounded above exponential and increases. Not much difference there as well. And you can prove, prove in, in, uh, also that the, um, the local and the global approach coincide here as well. So we have a notion of randomness that is associated with imprecise forecasts. Okay. Not very special, you might say, but you may be wrong in that. Why? Well, first, of all, there's a number of consistency results. The first is, is cute. It tells you that every forecaster believes that she or he, depending on what you want, is well calibrated. That's called forecaster he and skeptic she, just for fun. 
So Ford Galaxy believes he's well calibrated. So take any forecasting system, any way of attaching intervals to situations, then in that forecasting system, almost all the paths are random. In other words, the upper probability of the non-random paths is zero. So the measure, if you want the probability, the upper probability measure of these paths that are non-random is zero. So that means that almost all of them are random. There's like infinitely many random paths. That's one result that you have. So this, yeah. So, so if you are a forecaster, then in your own probability, in probability that, that you, or in your own expectations, the ones that are defined by your own forecast, all the paths, you believe that all the paths are random. Almost all of them. So that is what we call a well calibration theorem. You always believe that you're well calibrated. So this tells us that, that yeah, almost all the paths are random. There's a corollary that we will need for this, and it is that since there is infinitely many, there's always at least one. So take any forecasting system, any way of assigning intervals to each of the nodes in the tree, that will give you a forecasting system, that is a forecasting system, and there's always at least one path that is random for that forecasting system, that is well calibrated, that satisfies the random expectation. So what does calibration mean? Again, calibration means that I who try to test the forecaster cannot become infinitely rich in a computable way by betting with the forecaster on his forecasts. If I bet with him on weather, he gets forecast for weather. I am the skeptic, I want to bet with him, and each time use bets against him, then he is, he is well calibrated, the path is random for his forecasts. If I, as a skeptic, cannot become infinitely rich by trying to uh, bet against him without borrowing money, how much time do I have? Like half an hour? 30, 30 minutes, yeah. nearly there. So that is, that is the randomness. I cannot become, so, so this is why we call this well calibrated. You are well calibrated as a forecaster. If you do not allow anybody to become rich, infinitely rich in a computable way with your forecasts. Yeah. People cannot use you as a way to become infinitely rich by your forecast. That is why we call this calibration. Okay. And so, if you have any forecasting system, there is always going to be one path that is done. And we'll be using that quite often. Okay. Now, let's look at a special case. The special case where I use the same interval in each of the situations. This is a generalization of the fair coin forecast. In a fair coin, I have one half in each of the situations. Here, I'm just replacing the one half by some interval, but the same interval everywhere. Say one third, two thirds, everywhere. So I call that a stationary forecast. This is the same interval. Or a stationary forecasting system. So I get the same interval everywhere. There's another notion of randomness that is sometimes used with these, and I'm going to do this for the for the for the one half forecasting system, so for the fair point forecasting system. We call a path church random. If and now we have to look at this expression. So omega is my path. The value of omega at time k plus one is either zero or one. Yeah. And so assume that s is one everywhere. So what I'm doing is I'm summing all the ones and I'm dividing by 
n. So if s is one everywhere, what I'm doing is here I get the relative frequency of ones. Just sum all the ones and I, that I get in a sequence of length n, and I divide by n. So it's the number of ones divided by the total number of experiments that I've done. So it's the relative frequencies of ones along that path omega. So I have a path omega. I will call it church random. First of all, let S be equal to one everywhere if the limiting frequencies of ones is one half. But more than that, I will have add a requirement. I'm also going to use a selection process and the selection process is zero or one. So if it's one, if this selection process is one, I'm going to select omega k plus one. If it's zero, I'm not going to add that or include that one in or, or that outcome in my in my in my sequence of, of, uh, of values. So this S is just a way of selecting certain outcomes. If it's one, I'm going to select the outcome. If it's zero, I just drop the outcome from my sequence of relative frequencies. And this S is computable. I must be able to compute it in the sense that after observing the first K, I have a way of computing whether it's going to be zero or one. So this computer that they tell me, put in a sequence of zeros and ones, am I going to take into account the next one? Yes or no? So I have to compute, it must be computed. Classical church randomness means that the path is church random if I if I have these relative frequencies of ones for things that I can select computably, for subsequences that I can select computably, then still if I select subsequences computably, then still the relative frequency of ones must be one half, and the relative frequencies of zeros must also be one. That is what is called church randomness. And this is what we typically observe, right? If we have a sequence of zeros and ones that is random, then we observe that the relative frequency converges to one half. That is a law of large numbers in a way. Yeah? So you call the relative frequency, but it looks like the number of times you correct the guess one. You multiply. But if that's one, next. Uh, you multiply whether you select it by the outcome. So if it's zero, the omega k plus one is not going to be the outcome, it's not going to be in there. If it is one, I'm going to take that outcome into account in my sequence. So what I'm doing is, in a way, I'm selecting from my sequence of, of omega one, omega two, I'm selecting the subsequence. Computer. I'm just taking this one I'm going to take, and this one I'm going to take, and this one I'm going to take. And if I select that subsequence, it still will converge to one half. That is what I require. So, not just everything, not just any whole sequence of zero, that of one must be going to one half, but any computable way of selecting a subsequence must also lead to the same result one half. That is the idea. That is what we call church methods. And you can prove. That if sequence is Martin Luff random, it is also church random. So Martin Luff randomness implies this the fact that, that, that the law of large numbers will hold. That is something that you have. In the classical case, so for, for a fair coin probability. That is what it is. Oh, sorry. We have something more general. It says that. Okay, take a path and any interval forecast i that makes this path random. So I have a path and an interval forecast, a stationary forecasting system, giving the same interval forecast everywhere, and a path that is random for that forecast, so that satisfies the randomness condition for that forecast. Then this sequence of the relative sequence of ones will no longer necessarily converge to one half. It will no longer necessarily converge, but its limit inferior must dominate the lower bound of the interval, and the limit superior of that sequence must always dominate the, must be dominated by the upper bound 
of my forecast interval. And so if my forecast interval is precise, then the limit inferior must be equal to the limit superior and must be equal to that precise value. And then I get convergence. But in general, I don't have, I don't necessarily have convergence, but a kind of weaker notion of convergence or notions that are random in the sense. Okay. So these are a number of results that you can prove. And now I'm going to go to what I think is, is the most important part. I'm going to try and argue that why I think that the notion of randomness and the imprecision there is very important. The reason is the following. I'm going to give you a few examples. So first of all, consider any precise probability and consider a precise forecast in each situation. So I observe after observing x1 through xn, so a sequence of zeros and ones, the forecast is going to be the constant p. So it's going to be p and so whatever I observe, my forecast will be p, the precise number. Yeah. Okay. Then what you have is that for any path that is Martin Liv random for this forecast, we have that. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at, and this is what I said in the beginning, look at all the intervals that make this path random. So I have a path, and I'm going to look at all the models, all the forecasters, all the forecasters that make that path random. Typically, what we did do, as I said before, is I have a forecast. And I look at all the paths that are random for that forecast. Here, I look at it in a different way. I have a path, omega, and I'm looking at all the forecasts that make that path random, that are well calibrated to that path. Well, then a path is well calibrated, or a forecast is well calibrated with that path, if and only if it contains the precise forecast. So this is just all the intervals. This here is all the intervals that include P. It's like a fixed token, not a token, on P. That is the most simple example that you can get. But it becomes more interesting. If I have a recursive path, a path that is computable, if I have a way of predicting what is going to happen in a computable way, then, so take, take a path that is computable, for instance, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and you think what's going to happen on that path. That is what I call a recursive path. And I'm going to look at all the intervals that make that path random. There's only one, the vacuous one. So there is no non vacuous interval that makes a computable path random. The only one is the vacuous one. Now, should that surprise you that the vacuous one is in there? What does vacuous mean in terms of probabilities? <laughs> vacuous means that what is available to the skeptic is this and all these gambles here, all the negative gambles. Ah, sorry. Yeah. That is. If, if I am vacuous as a forecaster, this was what, what you were saying, right? If I'm, if I'm vacuous, I'm only going to allow this as a forecast. But that means that you, as a skeptic, can only pick gambles that are at best zero. Which means that your capital process, if it's to satisfy this, can only decrease or at best remain constant. So it can never become unbounded which means that all paths are random because my capital can never be unbounded. And for randomness, yeah, I need, oh, I, I need that. if I want to exclude randomness, I need a path that becomes that need, I need a capital process that becomes unbounded, but that is impossible. So this is why all paths are random for the vacuous forecast. And this is why, and, but it's the only one, the vacuous one is the only one that makes a recursive, a computable path Random. 
Okay, let's go further. Yeah. Thank you, stainless because the types. This is the fact that only the vectors makes it random. Is it just because no? Does it follow from the fact that no individual forecast, no precise forecast, makes it random? Or no. <laughs> Look at a different thing. I'm going to alternate my forecasts between two values, p and q. Let's assume that p is smaller than q. So for odd forecasts, I will get for for all, at all times I will use the forecast p, and at even times I will use the forecast q. So I alternate my forecast between p and q. This is a forecasting system. It's a precise one. I know that there is at least one path that is random for this forecast because any forecasting system has at least one path that is random. So pick any path that is random for this alternating forecast. It's not stationary. It changes in the heads of the and Q at different times. Yeah. I have a path like this, and I'm now looking at all the constants stationary forecasts that make this path random. And you can prove that a stationary forecast makes this path random if and only if it includes the integral P. So what is happening? This is interesting. I have something, a forecast that is non-stationary, that changes in time. And I want to replace it by something that is stationary. That does not depend on time because that's simpler. It's a simpler model. But this theorem, this proposition says that I can't do that unless my forecast is imprecise. So the idea is I can replace a non stationary forecast, a changing forecast. By a constant forecast and, and maintain randomness, but in order to do that, I must allow for imprecision. Remember what I said in the beginning? Sometimes, when you have a precise model that is complicated because it changes in time, you can replace it by a simpler model that is not changing in time, but you have to pay a price. The price you pay is imprecision. You can still do it, but you will have to make your model imprecise. Another cute one. I have, again, a non stationary forecast, and it goes to one half. It oscillates around one half in this one over square way. So it goes to one half and it oscillates above, below, above, below as a function of the depth in the tree. And the depth in the tree. Proof that this path is Martin Löw random. So take any path that is random for this forecasting system. There is at least one. Take any. Look at all the stationary forecasts that make this path random. They will. Make this part random if and only if the lower bound of your interval is strictly smaller than one half and the upper bound of the interval is strictly larger than one half. So your interval must strictly include the one half. But if you never, so it's, it's like it doesn't have one half itself, it can never be precise. There is no precise. There is no precise stationary interval that makes this path random. But any imprecise one that, that however close to it, any imprecise one will make it random. Yeah. The specific choice of grouping over at plus 30 gradient coordinates. Sorry? Is the specific choice of the square root of coordinates? The square root over n. Okay. So one over n. And then the other numbers are just make, to make sure that you remain between, between zero and one. Right, so that's why the essential behavior is the one over the one over square root of n behavior, which statisticians should be 
should be familiar with. Right. So this idea might lead you to suspect that this this imprecision in your in your forecasts is essentially due to the fact that you start with something that is precise and computable. And you approximate it by something that is stationary. What we see is that if we start something that is non stationary, then typically you will need an imprecise, uh, an imprecise um, forecast to make it random. By the way, something else I want to tell you here. For instance, this example, what does it tell us? There are sequences of zeros and ones that are not random with respect to one half, that are not random with respect to any precise probability, any precise forecasting system, but that are random with respect to intervals. So there are sequences of zeros and ones that satisfy this randomness condition. They are in some way random, but never for a precise interval, never for a precise value. But they are random for imprecise ones. So this gives you a reason for looking at sequences with imprecise randomness, right? Because they are there. So why would I assume for a process, if I am so inclined to assume that, that a process produces random numbers, why would I assume that the process, that, that, that the probabilities that are attached to it are precise? Because there are numbers that, or there are this, these sequences that are not random with respect to anything precise, but perfectly random with respect to anything Imprecise, however small. Yeah. But you mean constant imprecise? Constant imprecise, yeah. yeah. But still, uh, okay. So that is a reason for at least taking the notion of imprecise randomness seriously. There are sequences out there that are not random in a precise way, but are perfectly random in an imprecise way. That's one thing. Moreover, what we've seen is that if you have something that is non-stationary, then you can approximate this randomness by something that is stationary, but then it must be imprecise. So you could suspect that imprecise randomness is a result of this approximation, and only a result of this approximation. That, 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 that the only way that you can get to imprecise randomness is by making this approximation of non-stationary to stationary. That's not true. That is what this theorem does. It's take any stationary interval forecast I. And for any such interval forecast, there is always at least one path. This is what we proved. There's always at least one path that is random for that stationary interval forecast for that imprecise model, but not random for anything that is computable and more precise. So take any interval, and there are parts that are random for that interval, but not for anything that is more precise in the future. That, I think, tells you that this randomness of imprecise things is, or oh, this imprecise randomness is important because it's not always reducible to precise things. Because there are sequences out there that are not random for anything that is computable with a smaller imprecision. So anything for which the difference between the top value of the interval and the bottom value in the interval, taking the supremum over that in any situation is strictly smaller than the imprecision that we've given in the interval. 
So if I have something that is that is random, that there is always a path that is random for that interval, but not for anything more precise, be it stationary or not, but computable. And the computability of the forecasting system is important. So why would you, the idea is, and, and many people think that forecasting systems must be computable. How could you come up with a forecasting system that is not computable? How would you do that? That is, on a practical reason, the forecasting system must be in some way for practical reasons. You know, by computable, I mean, you must have some algorithm that produces your forecasts. If you don't have that, how would you come up with them practically? Okay. And then there's this final result. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat your question? From this theorem, you would infer that randomness is inherently in the results. Yeah. Well, the idea is that, that there are sequences that are essentially random for something that is imprecise, but never for anything that is more imprecise. In particular, never for anything that is precise. If something is precise, then the maximum of the forecasting system minus the minimum, these will be equal. So this will be zero. So, we need to, so it will satisfy this condition. Okay, so if for a precise forecasting system, the maximum minus the minimum is going to be zero. And so the supremum of zeros will still be zero and it will definitely be smaller than the difference between the maximum and the uh, interval here, if that is a real interval, if it's, if it's an imprecise. Then yeah, here what we're saying in this theorem is that there are parts sequences of zeros and ones that are random for this interval, but never for anything that is less imprecise or that is more precise. And that is why I think you can say that, it, that, that there are parts that, that, that for which the randomness is completely determined by an interval, but not for anything more precise. Therefore, the idea is, okay, there must be something to precision and randomness because of this, the existence of these of these paths. But interestingly, the computability is important, and this is a result that was proved by by Lewis. If I have an interval that is non-vanishing, then there is always a precise but necessarily non-computable forecasting system such that the randomness for the interval is equivalent to the randomness for the precise forecasting system. So let that sink in for a moment. We have an interval forecasting system, stationary. We've just proved above that for anything that is computable and more precise, there is a sequence that cannot be random for that one, but that is random for the original interval forecast. So that is the first result. The second result is that take any interval, then there is always a non-computable forecasting system. So it doesn't apply to this because this is only about computable forecasting system, but there is a non-computable forecasting system such that the randomness of omega for the interval is equivalent to the randomness of this interval for the precise but not computable. So what, we, what it seems to be is that this imprecision doesn't stem or seems to stem from the non-computability of the forecasting system. You can do it, you can, you can describe imprecise randomness with precise forecasting systems, but then they must necessarily be uncomputed. So forever unreachable by anything that humans do. Yeah? So this question taking two sentences to say that the answer may be understood. 
these contribution is not lost because that if you test sequence with the number of the rules, as for example, there will always be a sequence that passes the test, all the tests, but which fails to oscillate towards the other one. It's the fact that when you go to integral values that allows you to bypass the non oscillation because the integral is straddling the rate of the non oscillation to a more precise probability. Sequence will be random in your integral test because, because you're not you're not susceptible to the non-oscillation because the non-oscillation is staying inside the integral. I mean the oscillation is staying inside the integral. There's no precise point. I'm not sure. I need to think that it's an interesting question. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to you for a precise formulation. This always happens to me. Yeah, you ask questions and I can't answer them, and I need two or three days in order to, to find answers to them. <laughs> so I think that this is this is interesting, right? Uh, so there are sequences. If you want to keep your forecasting system computable, then these sequences cannot be described as being random to something that is more imprecise and therefore in particular as something that is completely precise. You cannot do it, but you can describe them by something that is completely precise, but then it must be non-computable. There, there must be no computer program that can have a that is, that is the idea. And therefore totally useless. So this seems to tell us that the, this, this Having to use an imprecise forecast seems to stem from non-computability. Non okay, now one more thing, very quickly. I've already told you that it's if I have a forecasting system, then Almost all the parts, so infinitely many of them, very, very many of them, almost all of them, in this measure theoretic sense, almost all of them are random. So the exception is the non random parts. The random sets, uh, the random sequences are the rule. Yeah? Almost everything is non random. Okay. Now, there's another result that says something related, but strange, I think, sometimes, although not so strange when you think about it. And I mention this because it's important, again, in the discussion of why we think that randomness is inherently imprecise. So take any interval forecast that is strictly included in zero one. Yeah? So I have zero one, the vacuous forecast, Entire interval, anything that is strictly included in there. So it mustn't go inside with either one on the, on the right hand side or zero on the left hand side. It should be strictly included. Okay, so the minimum must be strictly greater than zero or the maximum must be strictly smaller than one. And take the set of all the paths that are random for this forecasting system, for this interval forecasting system, station all sets, then this set of all the random paths for that system is meager. And meager means that it is a countable union of nowhere dense sets. That is a topological issue. Some people would say that means that there are few random paths, almost all of them. Topologically speaking, they are meager. They are a union of nowhere dense sets. Okay, whatever may be the interpretation of that and whether that is strange or not, what I want to point out is that the difference 
in this result is not between the precise ones and the imprecise ones. This result holds for all intervals that are not vacuous. For any interval that is not vacuous, the random sequences, the set of all random sequences will be needed. Which means that I impose certain conditions on them, and the result of imposing that those randomness conditions is that the resulting set becomes meager. And whether my forecasting system is precise or imprecise does not affect that result. Whether it's precise or imprecise, the result will still be a meager set. So the difference here is not between precise and imprecise. The difference is between vacuous and non-vacuous. If I have a vacuous forecasting system, everything is random. So there's no restraint. But as soon as I become non-vacuous, as soon as I say something, then the result is a bigger set. Whether that something is precise or not doesn't matter. The result is a bigger set. So in that sense, there is no real difference. The real difference is not between precise and imprecise. The real difference is between random, uh, vacuous and non-vacuous. There's many more things that we can say about this type of randomness and this imprecise notion of randomness. But I think <laughs> I made my point. And I'm going to let you enjoy a very nice uh, evening. Uh, don't forget to do your homework, though. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much for being so patient with me and being so attentive. Thank you.